It's no secret. People are drawn to polar bears. They're beautiful. They're terrifying. And they're adorable on Facebook. <laughs> they're studied by everyone. Studied by scientists, researchers, photographers, filmmakers, zoos, even bear psychologists. I'm none of those things. I'm just an artist. I love being an artist. It's all I've ever wanted to do and all I've ever done. It's, it's like a dream come true. I'm a painter, and that makes me a translator, an interpreter. I'm living the life I dream, so it sort of feels like I play for a living. I know my friends think so. Polar bears play too. I don't think we can save the polar bears, but I think they can save us. Now, polar bears are kind of like dinosaurs or maybe unicorns. We just believe what we're told about them, and then we go about our lives, because it doesn't really matter to our lives. Did you know? A polar bear has an incredible sense of smell, the best there is, much, much better than a unicorn. Polar bears can smell up to 30 kilometers and through a meter of solid ice. This allows them to find food and avoid danger. I've spent a little bit of time with polar bears. They're not unicorns, they're bears, and they truly do matter to our lives. In our world, adulthood means the end of play. Stop acting like a kid. Get a real job. Do things that matter, real things. But here's the thing. Play is real, and I think it's really important. I was eight years old when I taught myself how to paint. I was really lucky because I had parents that were absolutely okay with the destruction of thousands of dollars of art supplies. And carpet. I love painting animals the most. I spent long periods of time by myself studying every hair and whisker. I, I felt like I knew them. I felt like almost I could feel them. They became, became relatable and personable, like friends. It was hard to explain that then, and it's still hard. I just feel it. I used to sit under the table in our family room so that I could be by myself to paint, but not be completely alone. I paint by myself, and I love the solitude, but I like knowing that I'm not completely alone. I had found my passion, and I was thriving. In high school, my teachers and my parents, they urged me to find backup plans and real jobs. You should think about a university. They do something important. Art is a nice hobby, but you can't do it forever. You can't play forever. I moved far from home, hoping that a college degree would help me find real value. And then I met Debbie. In college, our drawing class would meet in the real world for sketch practice. In the fall of 1997, it was at the zoo. Uh, sketching a live animal is hard, they move around like crazy. And I found myself in front of the polar bear. She was beautiful, and she was also very old and sat very still. Debbie was the only polar bear I'd ever seen, and she was magnificent. Her cream-colored fur was the exact and perfect contrast in colors to the purplish-gray, genuine fake, subarctic rocks of her enclosure. After that first day, I went back almost every week, every month of every year. Even though I was there by myself, I never felt alone when I was with her. I got to know her, the ochre and the ivory in her perfect coat, and I watched her sense when people she knew were coming long before they'd get there. She would put her powerful nose up into the air and take in their information, and then she'd decide if she'd greet them or ignore them. She was like that. She was funny. She used to creep by the edge of her pool to surprise her keepers when they would come around, and she could never resist a stick in the pool. She smiled when it snowed, and I knew this because I smile when it snowed. I felt like I knew her. If anything, I felt like I saw myself in her. She was alone, she was trapped, and she was far from home. When I graduated from college, all my friends went to real jobs and in the real world, and I worked from my home studio. I liked the solitude, and I loved the freedom. I decided that I needed to be happy more than I needed to be rich. So I decided to work less and make more time for play, which is painting for me. I made it as important as I made my real work, and sometimes I made it more important. Yeah. I didn't know then how important that choice would be. Painting became my real job in the real world. In 2008, 11 years after I met her, Debbie died. She was 42, almost 42 years old, and that's a world record. In the wild, polar bears don't make it to 20, and orphaned baby cubs like Debbie, they don't make it at all. I couldn't bring myself to go back to the zoo. In 2011, I was moving a painting, and I accidentally painted it. I say accidentally, because when inspiration hits you, 
you just go with it. You can't help it. It was Debbie. I call this painting She. I didn't know that her image had been etched into my memory, and I really didn't even know that I missed her. I was a sleepless mom with three young toddlers, and I painted as often as I could because I find comfort in paint. I painted, and I thrived. I was familiar with mother's guilt, don't worry. I was often reminded that time passed so quickly and I should wait until my babies were grown to pursue my own happiness. But painting isn't a hobby. It's deeper than that. It's my language. It's how I process life. It's my way. If I can't paint, I can't breathe. I'm not a better painter the more I paint. I'm a better person. Last year, I woke up in the middle of the night with an indescribable pain in my hand my painting hand. Eventually, that severe pain attacked both of my hands and both of my feet and both of my elbows and knees and my back, and it was devastating. The months that followed were foggy with painkillers. I took thousands of tablets of ibuprofen, naproxen, T3s, and later a lot of morphine. I had splints, braces, x-rays, MRIs, doctors and specialists. I spent hours in waiting rooms and months on referral lists. It was the worst time of my life. I couldn't lift my youngest daughter out of the crib I could barely get out of bed myself, never mind hold a paintbrush. Without warning, the game had changed, and that's life. Eventually, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, a dysfunctional spleen, celiac disease, allergies to dairy, eggs, pineapples, bananas. The list grew longer and more absurd every day. I was pretty sure they were just going to say, look, you're allergic to yourself. My body was attacking itself, and I was trapped. I'm still trapped. And I was upset, and people said, ah, find a new passion, like passion's transferable. Doctors told me to rest my hands and put my paintbrushes away because the disintegration of my joints was inevitable. Instead, I just painted more. Whether I rested or I painted, the pain was the same. It hurts. I needed the comfort and the escape. I used different brushes and techniques to make it easier, and I tried my best to adapt. This is a painting I did called Sleep Where Darkness Falls. And what I never say is that she isn't sleeping. She's dying, and these are tears, and this is me, and this is how it felt. The pain brought a new urgency to my life. My blurry, blurry bucket list became short and clear, and my bedtime hugs became fierce and sometimes tearful. I wasn't playing to thrive anymore, I just wanted to survive. I struggled with alternative therapies that didn't work, and I found sporadic relief when I resigned to the aggressive drugs that would destroy my liver. <laughs> and then something great happened. Animal Planet called me. They were looking for an artist obsessed with polar bears to take to the polar bear capital of the world, Churchill, Manitoba. They wanted to document this life-changing experience for TV, and they wanted to take me. Now first, I'd never really thought of myself as a polar bear artist. I paint all kinds of things. Uh, it's not what I'm known for. I've done polar bear paintings, but they're personal. And second, I'm not an actor. I couldn't pretend that bears were going to change my life. However, Churchill was on my bucket list, and my answer was yes. To the people of the Arctic, polar bears are life. They're worshipped, respected, they're feared. They're an integral part of the fabric of the Arctic. To a shaman, a polar bear represents purity, death, rebirth, transformation. With the power of the, with the spirit of the ice bear, you're better able to navigate and find sustenance in barren landscapes. To the rest of the world, polar bears are megafauna. That's the big ticket in zoos. They're complicated political pawns, and they're the cute face of Coca-Cola. But to the people of Churchill, who are awesome, life is about coexisting with bears. Except the bears were here first, and that wasn't their, their plan. The fences are down, the warnings are up, and there's an electricity you can feel. Bear season is October and November. Polar bears congregate around Churchill because sea ice forms first, where the fresh water from the Churchill River meets the salt water from the Hudson Bay. The bears are waiting for that ice. They need that ice so they can head out to hunt for seals and replenish their fat supplies and energy. At this time, there are about 1,200 polar bears around Churchill and about 900 people. 
My first polar bear encounter was a surprise. I was there with a camera crew, but we hadn't even unpacked. As we came around the bend on a highway, we slammed on the brakes because there was a mother and two small cubs in the middle of the road. They stopped, and she motioned to her cubs to run, and then she turned to us. We were about eight feet from her, and she stood herself on her back legs, and she was taller than our van. She looked me in the eye. She put her nose into the air, just like I'd seen Debbie do, and then in a flash, she turned and ran off to join her cubs. It was terrifying. She was graceful. She was huge. She moved her 500-pound body like a ninja. And without a sound, she clearly communicated with her cubs and with us. We'd been warned. My second polar bear encounter was at the polar bear jail. That's a real thing. Polar bears that get too close to people are safely moved to the polar bear holding facility until they can be taken further north, north out of the way. This keeps people and bears from hurting each other. My presence on the outside of the building woke the bear inside, and the noises that followed were surprisingly and heartbreakingly human. He threw himself against the bars in his cage, and you could hear the anguish, the anger, the agony, the distress, and the defeat. It was haunting. Every encounter was like that. It was inspiring. I saw bears sprawling in the willows. I saw mother bears with their cubs. I saw powerful beasts wrestling like little boys. I saw scarred old bears like hidden boulders. Do you see them? <laughs> I saw sub-adults looking for trouble. And I saw bears getting along peacefully, happily. Not at all how I imagined these terrifying beasts. It looked like they were at some kind of party. I needed to know more, and, and truthfully, I just really needed to paint. Polar bears have a fur that's hollow and translucent. It covers a thick black skin, and this insulates them. And it makes them a dream to paint because they're essentially just a reflection of all the light around them. They're luminescent. Light is refracted and reflected and trapped inside their hair. Nature is kind of a badass artist. Their camouflage is terrifyingly effective. Do you see them? How many are there? They become, even in the summer, reflections in lights of lakes and ponds. And at rest, they look like snowdrifts and rocks. They blend in like oil paints to the shorelines and the ice formations. And just like in a painting, their palette of opposing forces makes them the ultimate focal point. Black and white, dark and light. Dangerous, but in peril. Predators, but vulnerable. If you do hear them before you see them, their low noises, called chuffing, will send chills through your spine. When I got home, I bugged scientists and researchers. I needed to know more. I wanted to know more. I wasn't obsessed. I was just passionately curious. Were polar bears playing? It looked like it. They seemed to play differently depending on who they were with. Big bears were very gentle with small bears, and bears of equal size had bone-crushing battles, but they never drew blood. They chummed like guys on the golf course, but there was no club throwing or beer. It felt obvious to me. Now, science, science. Science is of mixed opinion when it comes to why or even if polar bears play in Churchill. Some researchers aren't sure, saying it's really hard to study polar bears because they cover millions of miles through five countries in the Arctic. Some researchers say that if polar bears were to play, it just makes no sense. It's a waste of precious energy that they need to survive. The cost of injury or energy would outweigh the benefits because play has no value. It sounded like the idea behind me resting my hands, right? When the truth is, I get so much more from painting than any of the pain it causes. But don't ask me, because I play for a living. I'm just an artist. After that, Debbie's old keeper, Harold, found me and shared stories and photos, her astonishing intelligence and their special bond. He told me that losing her was like losing a best friend. Then I found bear expert Elsa Polson. She shared her passionate experiences with bears, and it cracked my heart open. She told me, or I told her, I promise I won't anthropomorphize these bears. Science had told me this was very wrong. And she said, listen, we don't anthropomorphize them enough. Bears are intelligent, feeling creatures with unique personalities. Ah, I had found who I was looking for. I thought about my paintings. This is Stella. That's what the painting's called. This is Harold. This is Tumble and Wash. This is Charlie. And that's Paul. And this is Louise. She's a bit of a grouch. And this is Calic. 
I would stare clear of him. When I asked Elsa about play, she said, of course they play. Play is important and complicated and specific and scientific. Play is valuable life experience. It's how they engage their highly intellectual brains. It's how they learn and prepare for life. It's, it's problem solving. It's the practice for fighting for mates and for food. It keeps their neurons firing and their bodies thriving. I totally like the sound of that. It was more nightclub than fight club. Oh, and do you know what a group of polar bears is called? A celebration. Look at that. Elsa also told me that Bears, polar bears, are not solitary at all. They're called social at a distance. They use their powerful noses to know they're never alone. I understood this completely. I used to sit under the table, remember? Oh, I was beginning to think that maybe I was a polar bear. Mark Dumas, a bear trainer and a polar bear owner, has worked with bears for 45 years, and he said all bears are extraordinary creatures, but polar bears are the Einstein of bears. Curious, creative, brilliant. They play with purpose. They play to survive. They play to thrive. Okay, maybe I was a little bit obsessed. <laughs> the last stop on my Churchill trip, my amazing guide, Kevin, took me to Garden, Gordon Point, and we stood on the very cold and incredibly windy shores of the Hudson Bay, and he said he'd heard I'd used to visit a bear named Debbie. And then he told me that this is where they scattered her ashes. This non-life-changing trip? <laughs> was a life-changing trip. Amongst all the people at Debbie's Zoo Memorial, I wasn't there. I never got to say goodbye, and I always wondered if she noticed me all that time. And I think she did. <sighs> I'm just an artist. I don't know how many paintings I have left, but I know that if I'm not playing, and if I'm not listening, and if I'm not being true to myself, then I'm already dead. It took me a celebration to understand that. The Aglulic say those who know how to play can easily leap over the adversities of life. Seeing polar bears play affected me greatly. I'm not just a kid that never grew up. I'm not a person without value. And I'm not just a patient with a disease. Like a polar bear, I'm a, a sentient and intelligent creature and I'm listening. I'm feeling. All this time I've been playing to thrive and now I'm playing to live. What about you? Polar bears thrive in the world's harshest climate. Imagine what you can do, how great you can be. Play like a bear. Be inspired. Be moved by their profound understanding of play, by their love of life. Find that part of you that stopped playing and wake it up. Play for your life. It's an enormous honor and a true privilege to be considered a polar bear artist. I don't know if we can save the polar bears, but I know if you're listening, they can save us. Thank you.